welcome to this health summit and let me introduce first myself this is uh, dr vandana varma i'm the director for behavioral health and psychiatry at hope clinic and this is my honor to greet all of you and thank you so much for coming and participating uh, in this uh, discussion we have wonderful guest experts here dr khurshid zia and dr uh, peggy yank and uh, our wonderful dr gore just approached me like about 2 weeks ago i was overseas at the time and then she mentioned about this uh, health summit and i was so excited and i said yes <laughs> and then i realized that we have to work a little bit to <laughs> to uh, present some data and to make it interesting but i was so confident that all the people those who are coming here they will be participating actively and uh, will be really active part of this uh, panel discussion so i have some slides here dr shah already set the stage with that much information and i saw that everybody was stimulated and uh, was participating so we have now some information about the numbers and about the api population who we are and uh, what's the prevalence uh, about the mental health uh, conditions in our population so i have prepared some slides and uh, this is just to um, to start the discussion and to talk about those topics but uh, as i said that we will uh, keep all of you into the discussion and we will go from here so dr jia would you like to introduce yourself first uh, my name is dr khurshid zia i'm an adult psychiatrist i have been practicing uh, in the state of missouri for the last 20 years i'm still practicing there and living here um, my kids uh, are practicing here there's a reason i move here and I joined Ibn Sina Clinic three, four years ago as a volunteer uh, psychiatrist. So I just provide my free community services there. Thank you. Wonderful. That's so amazing. Dr. Hey, Peggy Yang. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Peggy Young. I am a psychologist. Um, so he's MD. They're MDs. I'm PhD. And um, I am licensed in Texas and California. And then I also provide therapy interjurisdictionally across the, um, I think, 33 states now that are a part of the National Consortium for Interjurisdictional Psychology. And I'm currently at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, the bulk of my clients right now are the physicians and scientists at Baylor College of Medicine. Yeah, sure. So let me talk about myself. I'm an adult child and adolescent psychiatrist. I have been working with Hope Clinic for the last five years. And we have wonderful department, psychiatry and uh, behavioral health. And uh, we are focusing on um, providing cultural and linguistic, uh, um, you know, um, linguistic uh, uh, appropriate uh, services. So we have very diverse uh, uh, staff, including four uh, therapists, PhD level counselors, and a master's level uh, therapist. And then we have two psychiatrists, myself, child adolescent and adult psychiatrist. And we have another Spanish, English, uh, bilingual speaking uh, psychiatrist as well. And uh, I just uh, spoke with our data analyst and got some numbers. And uh, I was really thrilled to see the numbers that we are providing 1,000 uh, uh, Asian American patients in last four years and that data was from 2019 to 2023 and I was so thrilled and we have more than 5,000 visits during this period uh, in our RP population so it was really exciting and I wanted to do a little bit more research but that will, will be our next step to see uh, to, to break down those patients like where they were coming and uh, what is our breakdown for the ages and uh, the the issues wise as well. So let's just start uh, some of the discussions here. With the... So RP demographs, and uh, now we know who are RP. This slide covers, which Dr. Shah already covered. 
Uh, so we'll just go to the next thing. I find this uh, very interesting that, that uh, how, how educated our Asian population is in uh, America. And if you can see the numbers that we have, PhD level, doctorate level population, which is almost, you know, here the numbers you can see, and then we have white population and black and Hispanic. So the prevalent of the educated population is really striking. And Dr. Peggy Ying, one of her expertise is to provide, I think, uh, services, uh, therapy, and uh, resilience uh, services to our uh, experts, professionals. I, I believe it's medical students, resident doctors, and the staff. So would you talk about uh, the model minority and, and the issues that we probably might have some idea about it, but Dr. Peggy Yang is working in that area. We would like to hear from her and she will just shed some light about this issue and what she's seeing sure. in her practice. Thank you. Um, so definitely the, the concept of the model minority, you know, I think it, it can feel like an attractive concept sometimes, especially if you are a group who is discriminated against. But what we know from the research is really the construct of being a model minority is harmful. It prevents people from acknowledging when help is needed and from seeking help. It also creates this myth that we don't suffer from mental health issues or that whatever the stereotypes are, you know, we either have to conform to them or oppose them. And so it's really just creating this unnatural um, identity and mindset, right? And I would say that Sometimes, depending on how one construes being a model minority, it can feel like a strength. But if you dig deeper and look at it, it's really um, very harmful. And um, so one of the things that I often am helping my clients with, no matter what our ethnicities are, AAPI or Scandinavian American or, you know, Polish American is really how do we view ourselves and how is our view of ourself interfering with our relationships or with our ability to acknowledge that we might need some assistance and that we might need to reach out to Dr. Zia, Dr. Varma, others for some help because they have expertise in areas that we don't necessarily have expertise in. So this slide, if you take a look on this slide, this is uh, about the suicide in Cornell University from 1996 to 2006. And 13 out of 21 students who committed suicide between 1996 to 2006 were Asian, Asian Americans. So I was looking into the data and it seems like less than 50% of these kids have approached to the school or the campus related counseling services and psychiatric services. So I think that's what you're talking about in you know, a model minority. This is important that our kids, you know, the RP population as Dr. Shah also mentioned, you know, anybody could be victim of mental health. It's just about the awareness, motivating them and educating them to seek help in time. Otherwise it's too late. Just a note on the suicide, we we also know that we're talking about youth, but if we're looking at, um, I can't see the person from AARP, you were asking about elders, and there is some good data actually about elder Asian Americans. At one point, um, the U.S. actually got, SAMHSA put out a bulletin about Asian American women, elder women, having the highest suicide rates. That's the so, slide uh, next uh, year. Okay. I have pulled that the older Asian women have the highest suicide rate of all the women over age 64. So you can look at the number here. And uh, I, I, I deliberately put the numbers related to the RP population and broke it down for the women population and elderly population and young population. So I'll be just playing here and there as we go uh, into the discussion as Dr. Shah covered a lot, but I wanted to be specific about the age group and the populations. I think he talked about overall suicide rate and he did mention that Asian population does not have as much suicide rate as others. But in some categories, the RP population has higher suicide rate. So, 
Sure. Um, so in my former research life, I did a lot of research on um, acculturation, different kinds of acculturation. And one of the things that we know is this value of not causing undue um, work for other people, not causing people to um, have to do something for you. It's a very nice value in many ways. It's a very collective value that all collectivistic cultures share. Um, there's much consideration in that, but it can go awry to when we really do need help, then we kind of self-impose this um, law of behavior that we don't reach out and ask people for help for fear of causing them some undue stress or burden, right? And that value is passed down from generations. We know from acculturation research that it takes for Asian Americans, it takes five generations before our shift in values, not behavior, so not how we dress, not how we speak, to actually have a statistically significant shift. As you can imagine that, um, that's many, many years of immigrants, right? Dr. Yang, I would like you to uh, describe what's the acculturation and what are the stages and like, you know, how people go through it when they come from other countries to here. So would you please uh, explain us and everybody sure, here? Sure. We want to know more about acculturation. Yeah, so psychologists really love to parse things down to the minutia. So I hope I don't bore you. <laughs> I'll try to keep it simple. But in terms of acculturation, we've um, studied it from four different pathways. There is the assimilation pathway, which is um, you know, you immigrate to a country and there's so much pressure to conform. You you might have children and you encourage your children to speak English only, right? Or or whichever nation's language you are at, that language only. You stop maybe dressing the way that you may be dressed in the country that you came from. You stop eating those foods as much. Um, and that's assimilation, right? Where you're kind of thinking of losing or shedding the culture. Um, then there's integration, which is still maintaining your culture of origin and the current new home country culture. And then we have a combined pathway of separation or segregation. And that really is the same thing, just depends on what side you're on, right? Segregation is the individuals who experience the home country making them distinct and not equal. Right. Um, separation is when that internal locus of control is with amongst ourselves. And we say, you know what? I am going to stay with my Taiwanese Americans. Right. And, and maybe live in my enclave and only go to those parts of the city. Um, and then you have the last group, which is um, we call marginalization. So this is the most at risk group, especially for youth. And these are um, individuals who are not accepted by the new home culture. And then they also might be experiencing a lot of acculturation stress with their family. And so family might be feeling you're not blank enough. You're not Taiwanese enough. You're not Vietnamese enough. You're too American. But then at the same time, the Americans are saying, you're not American enough, right? And so for youth in the marginalized group, we know that these are the youth who are more susceptible to um, joining a gang because as all human beings, we like people, we like each other, we need our groups, right? And so we have to find a group and it's just a natural thing that we do to try to find whichever group is going to accept us where we can thrive. So Dr. Zia, tell us uh, what, what population uh, you see mostly in your practice. And uh, as we're talking about Asian American and Pacific Islander population, just tell us a little bit about your practice and this population, patients in your practice. Thank you very much. You, you, you know, I have been practicing in Missouri for the last more than 20 years, and that population is under my care is very different. I see 95, 96% white American people, and I see mostly other minorities, African American. I have few uh, Asian patients on in my practice, but I can count them on my fingers. That's so limited my experience. When I moved to Texas and I started working at Ibn Sina, 
then I see mostly uh, South Asian patient and Mexican patient. So my ex I have few uh, East Asian patient or Pacific Islander patient, but most of my patients are uh, South Asian and Hispanic at Ibn Sina Clinic. And my experience is very different over here as compared to the Missouri practice. The first thing people are asking me, so I want to talk to you in Urdu or the Hindi language. Urdu and Hindi are the language spoken in mostly Pakistan and India. And they want to talk to me in that language. And initially, I had no idea how to interview a patient in those languages. <laughs> it took me three months to learn and develop appropriate questions to ask them during the uh, psychiatric evaluation. It's, it's a learning process for myself, how to communicate with them. Finally, I have been working there for close to four years. And now I can communicate with them without using an English word. And uh, particularly the females, I talk to them, and, and then they feel very comfortable and wanted to see me. So that's the one new experience for me. And second interesting experience is that yeah, some of these patients, they're taking the medication from overseas, you know. They come to see you, and they <laughs> wanted you to prescribe some medication, and then they're also taking the medication from uh, overseas, you know. And then you have to tell them, oh, you don't need to take those medications when you are seeing a psychiatrist over here. You need to stop taking these medications. So that's another issue really uh, arises uh, in my practice. And the third experience is that people communicate. Communication is very rare. Uh, communication is very limited, really. They don't know the system. They have no knowledge how to get help, really. They have no idea what are the resources available in the in the city and how they can get the help. So that's the biggest barrier. And a lot of people have, you know, the immigration status situation. They have no legal papers, so they are afraid to go to see any other doctor. And they just want to come to see one when nobody asks any question about their immigration or legal status. That's another, you know, barrier for their uh, services. And another experience is that they have very limited resources because they come over here and they settle down in a new country. They are struggling to settle down and their financial resources are very limited. So they cannot afford too much. For example, a simple chest x-ray or simple test, they cannot afford. So that's another barrier they can face across, you know, when they come to see the psychiatrist. So these are the common problems I can see uh, during my uh, uh, ex practice experience at Ibn Sina. The other thing I said, the cultural problem within the family. So, for example, the parents are migrated from overseas and they're settled down there and kids are raised over here and they're born and raised in a different environment. The parents are measuring everything with their own scale in back home. And they wanted to impose those schools to their next generation. And that's created a lot of conflict between the uh, kids and the family. It's small, small things. I mean, for example, a, a, a female older patient was complaining. Her granddaughter went to see a movie with her friends and she was very upset because she's measuring that with their own country standard, where the females cannot go out by themselves and watch a movie and they said they go with the family members. And here, we consider that's a normal behavior for the child. You know, you go out and with your friends and have fun. So these are the small, small things you can see in your practice, how you can affect the family when they migrate from one culture to other culture. So these are my little experience at Ibn Sina Clinic. Thank I you. think this is an excellent example for cultural and linguistic competencies. As you said, that some of the patients, they will just come and they will see, oh, Dr. Zia, you seems like you're Pakistani or you're like, you know, you speak Urdu or you speak Hindi and they feel very comfortable that this person probably will understand my issues. I can explain this doctor my issues in, in, in a non non judgmental way. So this is so important in mental health. Overall, we understand that nobody wants to talk about what we call or like, you know, stigmatize as weakness, right? And that's not only in this population or API population, it's across every culture and every single uh, race and, you know, group or class. So I think Dr. Zia, you really helped a lot of those, uh, you know, people to make them feel comfortable yes. and uh, explaining themselves, you know. So that's why these points, what I put on the slide are so, so important. Just, just to sense them uh, what they want, you know. Sometimes they're nonverbal, but they have cues. They want to say, and we have almost now more than thousand patients, you know, Asian patients coming to us. And in last five years, I have learned, you know, certain things, mannerism that the, what they want to say. Before I say, I so I just make them sit there, you know, 
And I just look at them and make that connection, that human connection. And that is so impressive and that is so satisfying. And then they feel that comfort. And sometimes, you know, if they are not in agreement to any treatment or if they don't understand the condition fully, I just sit with them for 15 minutes and let their people like, you know, if they come with children or like some older people or friends, let them explain. And then, you know, I notice slowly that they want to talk and whatever English that they have, there's no hesitancy and they want to talk more. So that's where I feel like a win-win situation. So sometimes I just want uh, them to come for follow-up, you know, without even talking about treatment options. I just want them to feel like they have been heard. And then we go from there. So I'll just share one experience with one, one of my um, RP patients. Uh, she was coming and she was suicidal. She was educated. She was a professional engineer and had some issues at work, very severe issues. And she had young children she couldn't talk to. She had a husband who was working overseas. So really didn't feel like talking to anybody. And last six months, she had been depressed and had no idea. She just thought like, this is my new baseline. I'm getting older, premenopause, like, you know, I'm getting in fifties. So it's just my, you know, work performance is not good. That's why there's a lot of pressure. And uh, she was due for promotion. She was demoted and it was a lot. And one day see, she decided that she's not worth anything because these young children are not talking to her. She cannot explain her very well. She's very educated, very bright, but she cannot communicate you know, very well, even with her young children who grew up here. They were born here, they're busy, and she has been working every day. She's making food for everybody. And then they eat whenever. So I just asked, like, do you spend five minutes with your family? And she said, no. And she was like, Terry. She said, I have young kids. They just come. They take their food. Sometimes they eat what I make. Otherwise, they fix their meal. And that's it. You know, I really don't have anybody to talk even for five minutes in my family. I don't want to talk to my brothers and sister. I don't want to make them feel like I'm not doing well. And she pursued her PhD at the age of like, you know, 42, 43. So she was kind of like new in her job. And then one day she started from her work for somewhere. She doesn't know where she was driving to. And at some unknown place when it was dark, she just had some knife, you know, to cut the fruits and stuff. She tried to hurt herself. She had actually three marks here, very close to the carotid. She looked at up. Like, you know, and she went to the bushes in the dark so that, you know, she, nobody can see her mess. She tried. She couldn't do it. And then she went somewhere else. She got gas filled and then drove somewhere overnight. Like, you know, as if she will just in her way, maybe, you know, on her way, she will just crash or she will just do something and she'll fall asleep and she will be no more. But she said, unfortunately, did, that didn't happen. Then the next day, that was, she was like 36 hours into this journey, she went to some like remote Texas area and there she saw like some children playing in the playground. She just went there and felt like she should talk to her kids. So she asked for the cell phone and she left everything at actually her work. So intentionally she didn't want to keep anything that, or she didn't want to be traced. And uh, it was like, you know, so, so hard for me to kind of like, you know, listen to her story. And then she said, Dr. Varma, I just came here to, to learn, is it normal? Does that happen with other women as well? And she did not tell this to anybody. And this had happened after eight days that she tried to co commit, you know, and she, she came and she heard, uh, you know, from somewhere that the Hope Clinic have you know some services for for Asian population, and then she was in totally denial that she was depressed. She doesn't know what is depression like, and she said, "I was just declining. Probably I was not doing good." And she was just blaming so much guilt I have never seen in anybody's eyes. So this was her story. And then for next actually three months, she didn't want to take uh, treatment. She said everything is all right, and I'll try again, and everything will be all right. 
she was in denial, but I said, okay, let's talk, you know? And this was the first time she opened up with somebody about her story. And I said, okay, did you report? And I could see those marks right there. And she was like wearing something like, you know, high neck or turtleneck, even in, during the summertime. So that, that touched my heart. And slowly after three months, when she was following up with me, she started the treatment. And I feel like I, I really won, you know, there. She, I convinced her and she started the treatment and she's doing so well. She's doing another job and, and, and is happy, is still on the treatment. So sometimes we have to look for those cues, what they want. She wanted to do alternative treatment. And I said, okay, let's do it. You know, sometimes acceptance, you know, if you cannot convince, then just, just negotiate, you know, just go with them and, and just convince them whenever there's a time, probably they will, they will uh, learn that, you know, the treatment is there and they are the proper candidate. Sorry, I took so much time, but I got so emotional and involved in this <laughs> uh, case. Uh, and I remember I have several patients like this, uh, but this was unique and this was women and it's premenopausal, you know, and, and all of us, the, the journey start for women in their thirties for, for this premenopausal and we are more susceptible to, uh, to have depression, anxiety and other issues. And, and we are in denial because our past experiences so that we have, uh, you know, proved ourselves over and over. But, but that also gives some resilience. I mean, I would say there's pros and cons with this. So uh, Dr. Uh, Ying, I would uh, uh, ask you that what experiences you have uh, seen in your practice when you are providing resilience uh, services and therapy services to the experts uh, mm -hmm. at Baylor? I can talk about that, but could I um, ask for my slide to go up? Sure. There's a connected link here. Absolutely. Um, and I. It's probably the second slide. So anybody from audience, if you have any experience, you know, you can share and if you have any questions related to this. And uh, I will tell that uh, we at Hope Clinic, we have wonderful therapists. We do provide uh, some services, uh, uh, counseling services in Cantonese and Mandarin. Uh, so just I just wanted to say, you know, I prepared some slides just to really underscore why we are all here. And I um, thank you for providing that very personal story of suffering. I think, you know, it's a, it's a very sad story and I can hear sniffles in the room. It is a very, um, I hope your patient is okay also. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad she's getting care. Um, but, you know, I, I prepared just a couple of slides because I was excited about being in this space at the Hope Clinic to connect and learn more from all of you as attendees about the organizations that you are from also. Um, and, the, you know, there's little easy things that can bring us into a clinic such as the Hope Clinic. Even when we have the highest levels of mental health stigma, we might come in because we need dental care or we are experiencing something with our eyes, right? Teeth and eyes, so benign. There's no shame usually with that. Um, and then next slide. Um, but once we're in the system, the system serves as our gatekeeper to even more. Next slide, please. And so I, this was just, I talked with Dr. Gore uh, midway through registration about who else is attending. And so I apologize that not all of you are listed, but at the time we had all these organizations or Dr. Gore had all these organizations listed. Um, and it, it's just really a nice experience for us all to be here, to network together, to learn about each other's organizations so that we can help our patients to get even more deeply connected to specialties, research trials, other organizations um, that are in the Houston area and with the state level and federal level offices too that support so much of the work that we're doing. So I just wanted to pull my slide in because I think we're very connected there sure. in that point. Um, and you asked me about my wellness and resilience work. A lot of what I do is basically help people to learn how to stay well, but using evidence-based strategies, um, using a lot of what we know about neuroplasticity and how the brain can be shaped and changed. 
a lot of mindfulness techniques that um, acceptance and commitment therapy and other kinds of therapies have really brought in and that there's a lot of very strong research base on. Um, and I, I work with a lot of people who do everything based on research and have a really good, healthy sense of skepticism. And I invite that. And we go on this journey of let's just let's just run a little experiment. Let's see what happens if we try this technique. Let's see how your stress level or your anxiety um, or your lack of motivation or procrastination moves if we try these techniques. And it's it's a fun process, you know, when I can really develop a nice alliance with the people that I work with and um, we we go on this journey together. Do you have any other slides, Dr. Peck? That was it for my slides. Okay. I'll present two last slides. They are from the Hope Clinic's data. And I've I want your participation and what you think about that data. So let's do that. I think that will be really interesting. Just in last two slides, that's about the Hope Clinic data. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we can go to the first one before this. So if you see these numbers, Hope Clinic's behavioral health patients and number of visits during this duration from 2019 to 2023. As I said that uh, I prepared these slides just in last week because uh, I was overseas and I had so many patients. Uh, so uh, I asked our data analyst to pull some data and uh, I was really thrilled to look at those numbers. So we have total 1000 unique Asian patients those we served from 2019 to 23. And I wanted uh, this period because this was pre-COVID, during the COVID and post-COVID. And we had almost, I think, uh, 5,000 uh, patients uh, and 32 total uh, behavioral health visits. So this is total number of patients, those who came to Hope Clinic. So if you see the numbers, that's almost 20%. Uh, Twenty percent is a pretty big number that uh, you know that we are serving for RP population at Hope Clinic, especially just the behavioral health department, uh, and and we are only ten people uh, with the six therapists and two doctors, and most of those patients uh, I think are mine, almost uh, maybe two thousand patients I might have seen uh, the visits uh, in, in last four or five years. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this is a breakdown here, and we put that how COVID-19 might have affected our population. So the first number uh, we have in 2019, age-wise, age group three to 11 years, we have 133 patients in that age group that we served. And then this is pre-COVID, -pre 2019. And then age 12 to 18, these are our school-going adolescent populations, 222. And then age 19 to 34, these are like the breakdown is like, you know, college going and uh, early uh, career people, they're 301. And look at the number, age 35 plus. So this is a population where I just really wanted to focus. These are the first generation, most of them are first generation. And we served 486. Uh, patients. Uh, and if you see number 22, 2020 to 2021, this is time during the COVID. So what you see in age group three to 11, anybody wants to tell me what's the interpretation of this slide? This is during COVID, the number of visits for three to 11 it's decreased a little bit, but remain pretty much same. So this is an age group, uh, mostly like, you know, elementary kids or, or pre-school. Uh, so I think it didn't affect them that much probably. You know, that's what my interpretation, I would love to see actually the detail. And that's my next project to just break it down and just to see the correlation and research and put it together because we have really good data. This is pretty significant data to put into the like you know uh, into the research and 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 see kind of like you know what are the effects. So, 
yeah, what what your interpretation is looking at those numbers? So first of all, really, and uh, thank you for showing this. This is from the real world, right? Okay. But what I can see is a very interesting trend. You look at age um, 12 to 18 years old. So your COVID 2020 to 2021, 463. So you see an increase. So what is suggesting is that when the kids are staying home, particularly during 2020, lots of problem actually mm -hmm. showed up. When the parents or kids spend 24 hours together yeah. rather than 12 <laughs> hours together, right? Yes. Lots of different factors are coming in. So there could be real issues. There could be all more preservations. It could also be because of COVID. So what I see is that population, it, it seemed to be a tremendous increase there, right? That's wonderful. Anybody else? Any correlation? What comes to your mind when you see almost double, that number is double in that age group from 12 to 18. So these are basically our, uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers. So the number doubled in that period, 222 to 463. Yes. Really never had any anxiety before. That so. is such a great point. Mm -hmm. You know, the younger kids, sometimes they don't, uh, they feel anxiety, but they don't explain and they don't have that much understanding. But this group, this teenager group, you know, adults, and they understand what it is like. And, and, and some of my patients, like they have been accused, you know, they have been bullied. And some kids call them China virus. So at least, you know, a couple of kids, they came to me with this term that they have been called this. So that's what my understanding is. But as I said that I couldn't look into the visit because this will be a really good uh, research subject to look at the visit type and what their diagnosis and what, what their issues are. So that's, I think, the next year's project for me to work on this. But very, very good point. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed that you are giving some thoughts to it. Uh, let's see to age group 19 to 34, the same pattern. You know, the number went up from 300 to 475. So because of their job or they're working from home or they have spouses and, and more conflict, there were a lot of cases where there was like, you know, DV, the domestic violence cases went up, smoking went up, alcoholism went up, you know, in that duration. So we don't know the indirect factors which might be causing these numbers to go up. And then we'll see the age group 35 uh, plus, I think number almost double, more than 1,000, just in blacked out. I did not think I need the microphone, but I think it's the interesting thing is you look at the number of patients. So the number of patients either remain the same or decrease a little bit for age like 35, right? But what you see is the number of visits actually mm -hmm. increase. Yes. So, so I think that, you I mean, you probably have better explanation for why that's the case. Yeah, that's why the anxiety and the more issues, you know, they were seeing during this COVID period. That's why the number of visits are also increasing, you know. The number of visits, if you see in 2019, they are just less. And during the COVID period, actually, they were, they, they had more issues. So they, they were right. coming more despite being in COVID time and a lot of people were uh, not going anywhere. But at that time, we also started the tele visits. So, so the number went okay. up. I think we they had more issues. So a lot of people were doing televisit, you know, Thank staying you. at home. But but definitely, yeah. that their visits went up because Thank their you. issues went up. Thank you. I like that explanation. The the virtual visits make it more accessible yes. for the patients, right? But if you think about it overall, if you don't see the increase in number of patients, and only see the number of visits, then I think it's potentially could be more of the exacerbation of the stress during the COVID rather than of a reflection of, of something else because we don't see the number of in patients increase. At absolutely, the time. absolutely. It's the age group 19 to 34, there were some increase, but if you see in 35 plus, the number of patients, they decrease, but the number of visits actually, they increase. So, so that's that's the right uh, explanation that the anxiety and depression and you know domestic violence or or drug issues, alcoholism that went up, and that's why I think the number of visits they went up during that period. And it seems like in 2022 and 20 
23, the number of visits are pretty much same in, in other groups other than the 35 plus, which has gone down on the, on the first uh, uh, part of the slide. So anybody else have some explanation or thoughts? Maybe um, just, I, I'm curious to hear from all of you about meeting fluctuation, like fluctuating demand, because, you know, COVID arguably is one disaster, but we have natural disasters here in the Houston area. So just want to hear from you as practitioners, how do you cope with fluctuating like demand in patients and their, you know, the problems they come to you with? Thanks. In my practice, is is a, is a very tele uh, telehealth based clinics. So we we really were able to see the patient when they are sitting at home. They were not coming to the clinic. So we were very busy, and our schedule were full. And our clinic was able to uh, keep all the staff member, and even they were able to give some bonuses because they have to do some extra work because all the patients are sitting at home and they are keeping their appointment and we are able to provide care during the COVID time. So that's the benefit when the government relaxed some rules and allowed the patient to sit at home and allow the physician to be at home and able to provide care. So that's affected a lot, really. Did that answer your question? Maybe Dr. Yang? Can I have a question? Oh, not question. You say something about the patient seniors. In the last 40 years, the senior suicide rate in Japan has gone slowly up. I think it's mainly abandonment and loneliness because young people have to leave the villages to work in the cities, same as Asians here. I'm 75, so I can tell you from my, my experience, uh, most of my friends, their children are not uh, with them. They may get a job, you send them to Harvard, they go to work in New York, you stay here. And they don't even call you because they're busy with their work, with their kids. You don't even talk to your kids because they're busy with their lessons. So old folks here are very, very lonely. When they have medical problems, who they get to see? But something good about pop cleaning. I, I was on the board for 10 years, I just stepped down. We have doctors in the past, he will use his own time to visit the, to visit the patients. All right, so on the sixth year, year of my service here, the Hersa Dean came and I read the letter of that woman uh, to him. He was very, very impressed because our staffs use their own money to buy medicine for this poor woman. Nobody care about her. So I do believe it's not just the doctor can do something about it. It's not all but it's also the community can work together. Let a church, they have a senior class, maybe synagogues, uh, maybe the Buddhist temples, the mosques. I see them the same. The more you can serve the old people, the seniors, they'll be much better. And also we have so much family violence. We don't want to talk about. I remember AAPI had a meeting on Zoom. There were 42 people. Only two men, I'm one of the two. The other guy is from Pakistan. He's doing the uh, social work. And, but for this woman, they just complain, what can you do about it? So I finally, I suggest, why, why don't you start giving your wife flowers? Your children are looking at it, they're learning from it. And there are a lot of newcomers every month, maybe every week, like from Afghanistan, when he came here, that some of the women are pregnant and they don't want the male doctor to see them. So we need to change. We need the government help too. You need to teach the citizens, future citizens, before they come here. When you're in Rome, do as Americans do. I think it's important. We just fix the problem, they mess up. There's so much the doctor can do. But we respect the doctor. We have a doctor. When he goes to Chinatown, people know him. So I, I think the lady talk about language is not such a problem. If you love them, you want to serve them, they know you, they look at through your eyes. So don't, dis, don't be discouraged. I mean, it's such an excellent point. This is talking about the human connection. A lot of time, it's just the gesture. It's just like, you know, th those nonverbal cues 
they make those connections and they're sometimes stronger than using just the words. So Home Clinic used to have a banquet, business bank banquet mm -hmm. at the restaurant down there. So there are people from all over, from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Vietnam, from China. So they're all together. It's good. Maybe hope in the future, Home Clinic can do it again. It won't cost a lot of money. Sure. ALP was a supporter. I remember that. Sure, I think we we do need to together uh, do this thing, and you know we have to have more uh, people coming from not only from the medical uh, side, but but you know from the social from the society, from the community, more collaboration, and having those social groups, you know, just just getting to know each other and talking to each other, which is also therapeutic, you know, it's just talking two minutes with even strangers, you know, you feel that human connections, and and it goes a long way. Thank you so much. You, you know that Absolutely. you know there are certain studies have been done in in this country and all over the world. Okay, if the people or uh, the older age with good health need certain things. Number one, you need to live close to your family members, and number two, you need to spend time with your uh, friends. Number four, you need to add a healthy physical active life, not you know sitting at home and doing nothing. Physical active life and and then eat the healthy food. So if you follow these five rules, eat healthy food, spend time with your family, living close to your family, spend time with, with your friends, and physically active, that makes your life longer and healthier. And a lot of people, when they have studies, these uh, people, they found that these people who are living 90 plus age, and they are very healthy, and when they are following these four or five principles. Excellent. For the seniors. Get him out of the house. It, that, that, that's, I think community need to establish something within the community where the people can spend time together. And uh, like in the old uh, system, you know, people go on the street and talking to each other. But in ours, this society, we need to develop some uh, uh, some system where the people can spend time with your friends, you know, of their own age group, you know, that. Uh, that that's why they have YMCA, they have some seniors' uh, homes and some senior centers, you know, where you can go and spend some time. But we need to develop something in our, in our own community like that, really. That was my hope. Before we build this whole building, we were talking about it, and I hope they really do it. Let's start it from here. Let's get to know each other. And thank you so much, everybody. Please introduce yourself so that we know. And let's start this journey from here. So please, from the back, just tell us your name and uh, what you do, just briefly. And we will just go across the room. And Sure. Um, I'll keep this short and sweet. My name is Berta Salazar-Smith, and I'm a health education specialist with AMD Anderson Cancer Center. And I'm with the Department of Health Disparities Research with the Center for Community Engaged Translational Research. And essentially, we connect researchers to the community. Pleasure to meet y'all. Good. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Liu. I'm a professor at Texas A&M. University and um, School of Education and Human Development. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Jones. I'm a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner for Lone Star Circle of Care uh, based out of Georgetown, but I work in Harker Heights, and I'm also a DNP student at UT Health uh, here in Houston. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nayeli Santiago, and I'm work for Community Care Property. I'm CHW, and I'm work in three uh, work. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Johnny Durst, and I'm also a CHW for Community Health Corp, uh, Community Corp, and I also work as a substance abuse uh, coach inside the uh, Harris County Jail. Hello, hi, my name is Dean Liskam. I'm with Community Care Cooperative and we do community health work and are working with the Hackett Center right now on mental health issues. Hey everybody, my name is Ronald Abraham. I'm, uh, I represent uh, the Indian American Cancer Network. We are a resource to people who are diagnosed with cancer from the South Asian community, and we try to help them out uh, in whatever way we can. We have five minutes, so uh, if you can go with your name, that would be great. Hi, I'm Connie Asif, and I advocate for older adults uh, 60 and above in Harris County. 
Hi, Tina Tran, State Director for AARP. Hi, Gordon Shen, Assistant Professor at UT Health. Hi, good afternoon. My name is V Ho. I'm a, a teacher, professor at Texas Women University, and we involved in communities for many years. And I'm also a nurse practitioner, and we do see patients in clinic, and we see a lot of mental health issues in our community. Hi, my name is Christina Miyawaki. I'm an associate professor at the uh, University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. My name is Dominic Ho. Um, I'm the health advocate and also a professional assistant for this group back in the 80s. Hi, my name is Kim Lee. I'm, I'm an LPC LCDC. I work for behavioral, behavioral Health Services with Memor Armin, as well as private practice. Hi, my name is Johnny. I'm a family therapist. Hi, I'm Chen Lu. I'm, I'm a professor at the Anderson Cancer Center and I focus on developing culturally based strategies to help the health of Asian American, including both physical and mental health. Um, hi, I'm Sylvia Table. I am a manager with Memorial Harmon Southwest in community health. Hi, I'm Rose Yang. Um, I'm an assistant professor at BCM and I work at the Menninger Clinic. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Maya Borosian Zerbe. Uh, I am a mental health uh, specialist. I am doing uh, some uh, mental health um, uh, psychoeducation and uh, psychosocial support for some Arab refugees at the Future Beyond uh, Charity uh, for now. And I'm hoping to get. Uh, more uh, involved in this uh, in the mental health. Uh, we have committees. just one gentleman, and I think this side we will be done, and we already know you guys. So, yeah, yeah. just the gentleman. Oh. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Eddie Orem, and I'm with the Executive Council of the AARP. Well, thank you so much. Our time is over. I think. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. Thank you so much, our guest, uh, Dr. Peg Gang and Dr. Jia. And thank, thank you, you everybody much. here. Uh, and we will continue this uh, discussion, I think, uh, uh, with, with the other set of uh, panelists.